Okay, hello everybody. This is me, and I'm here trying to uh, help you figure out uh, what's going on in this chapter. I'm sorry that I'm not in school uh, today again, but I'm um, still sick, so hopefully I'll be there tomorrow. Um, anyways, when you look at this cartoon, it has to do with the post-World War I time after the Treaty of Versailles. And um, as you look at it, the question is, what's the main idea? And hopefully you can see uh, who these people are. are. Uh, this fella over here on the left would be Woodrow Wilson, and his expression is kind of like, whoa, what, what are we doing here? Uh, Germany would be the, the man about to be uh, beheaded. Uh, Clemenceau is the Frenchman, which it's a guillotine, so you think of France. That would be the French representative at Versailles. And then on the right, we have uh, David Lloyd George, who you know, doesn't seem to be incredibly... Uh, opposed to it, but he's not entirely supportive either. Um, because remember, Britain and Germany were pretty good trade partners, so Britain wanted Germany to be punished, but not too much, because they didn't want to hurt their business. Um, you know, the question after this is, you know, can there really be peace after uh, after this war, particularly with how Germany has been uh, treated? And there was a British economist, uh, John Maynard Keyes, who wrote about uh, and spoke a lot about the fact that these reparations, which would turn out to be about $400 billion in modern uh, money, um, was going to just kill the German economy. And as it turned out, um, you know, he was totally right. It also, um, besides just damaging the... Um, <clears throat> Excuse me, I can't breathe. Um, besides damaging the economy, was just part of uh, you know the personal insult to the Germans. They were totally humiliated with that Article Two Thirty One. So, nineteen twenty three comes around. Uh, the treaty has been ratified, and things are moving on. Well, the Germans are falling behind in their reparation payments, and so uh, France and Belgium, right? Uh, you can see France, and then Belgium's right here to the west of Germany, um, they actually move troops into the area that I've highlighted in yellow. It's called the Ruhr Valley. And what they were going to do is they were going to directly uh, extract the uh, coal and, and other things that were being mined from that area and take it in lieu of payment of their reparations. And so the German workers in the Ruhr Valley said, hey, we're not going to work for the French and the Belgians. And so they went on strike. And that pretty much brought the whole economy right to a, a crashing uh, standstill. So to compensate for, uh, for that, the Weimar Republic opted to begin printing money. And it had... Uh, it led to something that we call hyperinflation. When you take, pretend you had a glass of uh, uh, chocolate milk, you had a half a glass of chocolate milk. Um, if you want a full glass of chocolate milk, you can't just add more white milk because, yeah, you'll end up with a full glass, but that glass is going to be really weak chocolate. You know, it's going to be diluted. And so that's basically what was happening to the German currency. They were just printing more money, and it, wasn't, it didn't have a value. So the value of the money became less, which meant the prices of goods increased. Um, the pictures on the screen show children uh, playing with uh, stacks of money like it was just blocks, like building blocks. Uh, the woman in the middle is is starting her fire in her kitchen stove with money, and you know the guy on the right's wallpapering with it. Um, I have a million mark uh, dollar, or it's not a dollar, but a million marks uh, in my filing cabinet that is only printed on one side. I bought it on eBay, and when I bought it, the person selling it said, "I think it's defective because it's only printed on one side." And it wasn't effective. That was how they were printing money in 1923. It, it wasn't worth the ink to print on um, two sides. So this slide here, if I were in class, would be very dramatic. But what it does is it shows how much it would cost to mail a letter in Germany. And I've um, made it the equivalent in, uh, in the far right column in U.S. dollars, just so you can kind of get a feel for what it would cost. And you can see how the prices increased dramatically. Now, they had already started. 
So in July 1923, if you wanted to mail a, a, a letter, actually a postcard, it would cost you 300 marks, which would in modern times be the equivalent of $5. That's already pretty high. Um, if you waited a month, it would cost you three times that much. Um, if you waited another three weeks up until August 24th, it would cost you 20 times more. And you can see how the increase in those prices, I mean, if you look by October 1923, it cost you 10 million marks to mail a postcard. Or if that were U.S. money, it would be the equivalent of $166,000. I mean, you know, ridiculous. Now, hyperinflation helped people who had loans because it got really easy to pay your loans back. But it was disastrous for people who depended uh, upon their savings. You know, older people uh, who, you know, planned on living their life out, you know, in, in, uh, in their, their little nest egg that they had saved all their lives. Um, it continued even more. Uh, night by November, right, we started in July. By November, it's 100 million marks or $1.6 million. By December... It's a lot of money. You know, I don't even know what that is. What, that's a hundred million, a hundred trillion dollars, right? Ridiculous. Um, and so people would literally take wheelbarrow loads of cash to go and buy things and they would leave um, their jobs like at lunchtime and run out and buy things and then go back to work because the price of their goods uh, would increase. You know, a loaf of bread might cost them, uh, you know, 10 million marks at eight o'clock in the morning, but it might cost them 20 million marks by that, that evening. So it was a, it was a really disastrous time. So on the home front, there were a lot of problems. We had conflicts between communists and the social Democrats uh, in Germany. We, uh, the Weimar Republic was the most unpopular um, government pretty much in Europe. Uh, the French, uh, communists and socialists, were trying to win office through democratically uh, elected, um, or democratically, um, what's the word? They had elections where they voted for people. Can't think. Um, and Which kind of would be, I don't know, doing what you need to do. Not exactly desperate times call for desperate measures, but a little bit. And then in Britain, um, you know, they were they were recovering a little bit easier, and uh, socialism certainly became uh, a growing part of the of Great Britain, with the government assuming the responsibility to provide the basic things for the people. Now, you know, in this time after World War One, nobody wanted to contemplate uh, the prospect of another war, and uh, so you know there was some some cooperation to try to deal with. Uh, the issues that had been created when France and Belgium uh, occupied the Ruhr. So um, there was a plan known as the Dawes Plan that came up with a way to basically refinance uh, the German reparations. And so what would happen is the United States would loan money to Germany. Uh, Germany would then use that money to pay their reparations to France and Britain and anybody else they owed. And then France and Britain and those other countries that had borrowed money from the United States would then repay the United States for, uh, for loans and for weapons and such that they had gotten during the war. So seemed like, you know, a pretty good plan. The problem is that it really connected all of the economies of the, um, of the, of Europe and the United States, you know, very, very uh, intimately so that when we're going to have uh, a stock market co collapse in the United States in 1929, it's going to be a global, um, have global effects. Um, some other efforts at peace, you read about the spirit of Locarno, which uh, basically they agreed on borders in Europe and, uh, and, you know, said that they're going to talk about problems and not going to go to war with each other. Kind of a nice, nice thought. Um, the other one was the Kellogg-Briand Pact, which uh, is where uh, several European nations agreed to um, renounce war as a way to settle disputes. 
So, you know, they said, if we have a problem with somebody, we're not going to go to war and beat them up, which sounds really good. But then, you know, what do you do if somebody breaks that pledge? You know, you have to go beat them up. But it, those things, uh, the Kellogg brand, the Spirit of Locarno and such, are important because they did show that um, that people were trying to uh, work in a, in a way to prevent the, the horrendous uh, war that they had already experienced once. But, you know, there's a lot of hindrances, hindrances uh, to peace. Um, the German people are not at all happy. Uh, they hate the Treaty of Versailles. They hate their government, the Weimar Republic, which was created at the end of the Great War and was blamed for su signing the treaty, you know, which they had no, um, <coughs> excuse me, they had no uh, choice but to do. <coughs> I might live here. Um, the French were, you know, con continued to be afraid of, of, of a powerful Germany. You know, if we look back here for a second, you can see the, the Rhineland is this area that's, has the, uh, the diagonal lines. Um, you know, but the French, they, they were pretty concerned about, um, you know, a future attack. They had been clobbered in 1870, 71 with the Franco-Prussian War and, you know, devastated during World War One. So they were afraid. Um, the British were really interested in promoting their their own economy, their trade. Um, their attitude toward Germany was, you know, we want to have good trading partners, but we also want you to, you know, feel responsible for all the damages that you've caused. Um, the United States said, adios, Europe. Um, been there, done that. We don't want to get involved. Uh, the U.S. rejection of the League of Nations um, led the U.S. to never actually sign the Versailles Treaty with Germany um, because the U.S. Uh, Senate did not want to get tied up in uh, the potential to be drawn into war without, um, without having a say in it. So the U.S. is staying out of the mix. Uh, Eastern Europe, we're not really sure what's going on in Eastern Europe yet. Russia uh, had converted in 1917 to communism, you know, not sure what's happening there. Uh, the French and the British, um, you know, have their mandates in the Middle East and other places and which had rejected Wilson's ideas of, uh, of self-determination. And then there's the whole issue of reparations that is just, you know, killing uh, the Germans uh, figuratively. So, in 1929, there is a stock market crash in the United States. And that crash came about because of, uh, of, of several factors. And one of the factors was this consumerism that had developed after World War I. Um, you know, industry had really promoted a lot of the weapons and destruction in war, but it had also, you know, perfected things like the assembly line, and there were lots of new products available. And so both in America and in Europe, you know, people were buying can openers and toasters and refrigerators and, and all this stuff. And the, what had happened is the government, I'm sorry, not the government, the businesses would make it possible to buy these things on time. You could like installment plans. They didn't have credit cards like we do today, but you could go to the store, buy um, a refrigerator and, you know, pay, uh, you know, a buck a, a week or, you know, a couple dollars a month, whatever for it. And so people really began doing that a lot. Um, even some stock buyers, I'm going to sneeze, maybe not. Um, even some stock buyers would do that. It was called buying on margin. They would pay just a fraction of the actual amount of stock and borrow the rest. And as long as the value of the stock increased, they were fine. They'd make a profit, they'd sell it, pay back their loan. Everybody's happy. But what that did is lead stocks to uh, a really uh, false value. And so the stock market got really high um, and people started getting a little worried about it. Uh, there was a massive sell-off and <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, basically in October 1929, the stock market just fell through the bottom and, uh, and crashed. And, you know, lots of people lost, lost their money. There was a run on banks. Um, you know, businesses suffered. Uh, and unemployment it really, really skyrocketed, um, both in the United States and uh, globally. And the reason why it was so intertwined was because of this. 
because of this Dawes plan that had uh, linked the American and the European economies um, so closely together. So the picture on the right is a guy in Austria talking supposedly to 50,000 people. I don't know how a guy without a microphone can talk to 50,000 people, but um, you know the image is there. Uh, on the left, you have people like at a soup kitchen. You know, and this, these weren't just bums. These were people, you know, who had a great job, thought they had a great job, thought they had money. One day, the next day, um, it's gone. This chart shows um, the millions of people who were unemployed, and you can see Germany in red has a far greater um, unemployment problem than Britain has, and so you know. Desperate times call for desperate measures, and it's it's the combination of hyperinflation, which they're already, you know, people already lost everything. Now unemployment that's going to allow a guy like Adolf Hitler to rise to power and, uh, you know, be as popular as he is in Germany. I have one more slide here just showing the unemployment in uh, in Europe and uh, you can see if you look at Germany, I mean, the other countries are in the tens and hundreds of thousands of unemployed people. And in Germany, it's in the millions, right? It's in the millions. So, um, you know, Britain is also affected as well because of its close economic ties with the, with the U.S. So that's pretty much the um, economy and the plans uh, for peace that, Sounded good, didn't really work out so well since we have another war coming up called uh, World War II. We can assume that World War I uh, was not so good. I have a PowerPoint uh, on art that is on the wiki. I suggest you take a look at that. And I also have a pairs check for uh, World War I and the Age of Anxiety. And I suggest you take a look at that tomorrow because there will be a test on... Um, Thursday on these two chapters and I'm really sorry that I hate to be out um, any period any day but I really hate to be out you know right now as we're getting close to the end of the uh, the course and looking for the AP exam so um, yeah I hope this helped you a little bit and uh, hopefully I'll see you on Thursday okay bye